Y'all, it's very, very good to see you today. Um, this is the first time I have ever worn this suit in my entire life. I, and sure enough, I've never worn it, and I show up today, and there is a church member wearing the exact same suit. I, I, I told him, one of us is going to have to leave the prom today, and it ain't me, buddy. It, they, it is an experiment, though. Y'all, I'm happy to see you. I've been at youth camp all week so far. That's why I'm silly. And uh, I'm going to finish preaching. And then Dory and me, Dory is there too with me. Jordan Corona is there. And and so we Zoomed back late last night after worship with the youth. And we're going to go back today. Y'all have the best, best youth. They're doing so well, parents. Um, We have about 100 kids they came, they invited their friends to camp, and not last night, the night before, six of our kids gave their life to Jesus for the very first time. It was awesome. I don't know what's going to happen uh, tonight and tomorrow. It continues to be a great, great time, and uh, uh, be in prayer for them. Be in prayer as we engage mission work, and when you include all of the kids who've given their life to the Lord at youth camp and also vacation Bible school, it really is a miracle unto the Lord. Well done, church. Exciting. Well, I I finished last week the sermon series on the book of Galatians. We went piece by piece all the way through. And so today, uh, we're not in a sermon series. And so it's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, guys. Happy Father's Day. I love you all very, very much. I'm grateful that that you're dads not just to your biological kids, but you're dads to our church and, and many people's children around. I look out and see so many of you that have done that. And, uh, and I'm grateful. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for our representative, Colonel Terry Wilson, and all you've done for our state and uh, our nation, Terry. Thank you, brother. And uh, y'all, it's a, it's a great day. Um, I have a, a unique sermon today. I've never preached on this in, in, uh, in my life, and so I'm excited to talk to you about it. Uh, I think it's going to be something that's very applicable to our very life. It's exceedingly practical. Would you open your Bible with me to 1 Samuel chapter 25? 1 Samuel chapter 25. I know you don't traffic in 1 Samuel too often, perhaps. It's in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel 25. We're going to read verse 6, and then we're going to skip down and read verse 36. And so, uh, as I read verse 6, you're welcome to stand with me as we read this together. First Samuel, chapter 6, I mean, t- chapter 25, verse, verse 6. It's a unique blessing that David, before he is king, gives to a man named Nabal. And David is camped outside of the ranch of Nabal. And and so he says this. He says to his servants, I want you to go to this guy Nabal, and I want you to give him a blessing, kind of a prayer for his health. And here's the prayer for his health. It says, um, verse 6, Say to Nabal, long life to you. Good health to you and your whole household and good health to all that is yours. Isn't that a great blessing? Good health to you. Live a long time. May God make it so. May Yahweh, the Lord of all, uh, of all the world, help you to live a long, good life full of health. I love it. Let's see how it worked out for him. Turn the page, 1 Samuel 25. Look at verse 36. You're going to find out Nabal was a jerk, but uh, he had a great wife named Abigail, who's really a hero of the story. And Abigail goes to her husband, Nabal. Now, Nabal's the one who got the blessing. David, man, may you live long and may you have great health. Here's what happens. Abigail goes into Nabal. He is in the house holding a great banquet as if he is the king. And he is in high spirits, and he gets very drunk. So she told him nothing, because he wouldn't have remembered anyway. Tells him nothing. 
And then the next morning she tells him, it says, tells him everything when he is sober. And when he hears it, his heart failed, which is the Old Testament way of saying he had a heart attack. He had a heart attack and he became like a stone. And 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. About 10 days after David said, may you live a long time, Nabal, with great health. And so today, the, the title of the sermon is, Here's to Our Health. Would you pray with me? God, we pray that you'll be with us as we think about this passage and several others that do talk about our health, talk about how we're trying to be stewards of our body in a world and in a culture that um, as it pushes back on us regarding um, um, sin or materialism. It, uh, re Lord, our culture always seems to be against all of the things you've commanded us to do. Uh, and Lord, it's hard to, to be healthy in this culture today too. And Lord, though we know that it's what you want for our life. So be with us as we think about it through the lenses of scripture and, and from a spiritual theological perspective. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Amen, y'all. Did y'all hear about that, that one lady who um, went to the doctor for the very first time in her life? She had never been to the doctor, and, and she goes there, and she's waiting in the lobby, and she is nervously thumbing through the magazines, and, and, and then all of a sudden, to make matters much worse for her anxiety, she hears, coming from the doctor's office on the other side of the wall, a blood-curdling scream. The door flies open, and she sees a nun run out of the doctor's office with her black robe just flying behind her. She's screaming. She blasts through the door and takes off. And the doctor is, is a few seconds behind, and he's yelling for her, wait, 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 hold on, but she's already gone. And then he turns and he sees his new patient sitting there and he walks over to the lady and sticks out his hand. He says, hi, and introduces himself. And, and she's already nervous and she saw that and she throws her hands back and says, don't you touch me. You stay as far away from me. I saw what you did to that nun. And, and he said, lady, what in the world's wrong with you? I didn't do anything to that lady. And he said, all I did was tell her that she was pregnant. And, and the lady says, what? Pregnant, but she's a nun. How, how could she be pregnant? Is she really pregnant? And, and the, the doctor said, no, but it sure did cure her of her hiccups. And uh, I love it. Here, here's what it reminds us of. Often the cure is worse than the disease. Often. Now, so rather... They just live however you want uh, in any kind of unhealthy way and just think, well, doctors will take care of it later on in life. Rather than let it get to some kind of place where they are forced to, to maybe give things where, where the cure is hard. You, you, you see all of the advertisements for all of the different drugs of various things. You think, man, this is my issue, but if I take that, here are my issues, you know, which one do I do? I do? So I want to talk about this. On this, happy Father's Day. <laughs> about how Christians, Christians are supposed to work to prevent illness. Prevent illness in our life. The more we can prevent illness, the better. The healthier we're going to be. Throughout Israel's history, they cared a lot about this. And so when they would go up and talk to one another, after the normal greeting of Shalom, may the Lord be with you, they would often follow that up with a kiss on each cheek, and then they would also give them a blessing for their health. And they would say, may you live long, may the Lord be with you, may you have great health. And then the, pe the person that you're giving it to would often give you a blessing just like that. In 1 Samuel 25, that I read a moment ago, you see a similar blessing. David says, long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. In 2 John, uh, 3 John 2, it says, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health. I like those blessings. I like them a heck of a lot better than the Irish kind of toast blessing that says... May those who love you, love you. And those who hate you, may the Lord turn their hearts. 
And if the Lord doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so that you'll know them by their limping. I like the first Samuel one a whole lot better. First Samuel, it says, say to him, long life to you, good health to you and your household. And it does remind me of all the great prayers that, that we pray for each other, don't we? Do you all know that probably 90% of the prayers that I get for all of you and that you get probably for each other, about 90% don't have to do with the most spiritual things in the world, but they often have to do with our health. Um, we have a board in our office and it has members of our church who are sick and in hospitals who have cancer. We have a prayer list and, and it's just a mile long and, and we pray for each other's health. We ask for the Lord to bless and be with us. We, we talk about health a lot. And, and in this passage of scripture, uh, it, when it talks about praying for health and talks about this idea of 1 Samuel 25, uh, may the Lord help you to live long, who is it talking to? And second, did it work? What, what becomes of this man? And, and so here's the background. I'll, I'll catch you up. David is not yet king. Saul is the king. And he is chasing David all over the empire. And he's running everywhere trying to, to escape for his life. David has had a couple of chances to kill Saul. But, but God says, don't kill Saul. And, and, and you have to respect him. He's your king. And David is, is pretty amazing. Now, to this point, David has never lost a battle. He's the one who killed Goliath. This is, David is amazing. And, and he has about 400 fighting strong, I mean strong guys. And they are all camped out on the ranch of a, of a massively rich rancher named Nabal. And the Bible talks about how wealthy this rancher is and all of the sheep that he has and all of the land. But King David and his men, or he's not king yet, but David and his men are all camped there and they're all very hungry. But because they have not asked Nabal for any of his food, they don't eat it. They don't take any of his sheep. In fact, the Bible says that he is protecting his sheep, maybe from wild animals, maybe from bandits, but he's actually protecting all of Nabal's property. Finally, David and his men are just hungry, hungry, and so he sends Nabal a message and he says, I, I, I want to bless you. I want the Lord to bless you. I want your health to be blessed. And then he says, could we um, have some of, your, some of your cattle and some of your sheep and, uh, to, to eat? And Nabal says to him, rather than the normal, yes, and rather than sharing, which is what the, the, the custom was for people who were hungry, rather than sharing with them, he says, no. And he says, I don't care about David. And, and, and sends a word back to David with all of his army who are starving that they can't eat. So David is furious about all of it. And, and he tells all of his men, he said, all right, boys, put on your swords. We're going to go and pay Nabal and all of his shepherds a little visit. And so all of this army is going and man, they, they're going to attack Nabal. They're going to kill him. And they're just furious about all of it. And so here's what Nabal has uh, really going for him. He has a wife named Abigail. And Abigail is wise and Abigail is loving. And, uh, and, and of all the things that Nabal has, this is the most important thing. I, I uh, empathize. I, I like that. I, uh, that's what I have going for me as well. I have a good wife like Nabal does. She runs to David she gets a donkey and she puts all of this food on, on the donkey and she says, I'm going to go and, and try to convince David not to come and kill my husband. And so Abigail goes and she offers everything to, to David that she has. And this is what she says to him. She says, please don't kill Nabal. He's going to die naturally because he is a fool. <laughs> it, you, you just, it's, she says... He, he's such an idiot, if you just give him a rope long enough, he'll hang himself, David. Meaning, you don't have to, you know, bloody up your hands with this and then God judge you. you none of that. He'll, it'll happen naturally. I really know him. So listen to me, take all of this and just let God deal with all of it. And then she says, he's such a fool. And, and she says, and folly will follow him. Folly will follow him. 
And so David says, you're awesome, Abigail. I'm not going to, to kill him. And then in verse 36, she goes back and, and she finds her idiot husband uh, uh, partying. Right, and, and, and it is ironic. He's in the house partying like he's a king. And David was on his way to put an end to the party. And he doesn't even know it. And, and he's, he's drunk and uh, he's eating and everything. And so the next morning he finally sobers up. Abigail shares with him, this is what was, I mean, about to happen. I met him just on the other side of the house. And here they all were. And here were you. You were an inch away from dying. And, and, and it stresses him out so much. And he begins to panic. And he has a heart attack. And he has a heart attack, and then he dies 10 days later. His own foolishness did catch up with him. And y'all, I think that is the strangest ending in the whole world for a man that we were introduced to like this. Long life to you. Good health to you and your household. Good health to all that's yours. What do y'all make of it when, when, when we see in the Bible somebody saying, good health, good health to you? And then you have somebody else who is so foolish he dies shortly after. I think the wise, very applicable uh, teaching that we can gather from this is, is this. People can pray for your health all day long, and you can pray for your health all day long, but... If you live like a fool, then your actions are going to catch up with you one day. Good health is much, much more than well-wishing and, and praying. Sometimes the prayers are not even heard because they're just so ridiculous. The Lord Jesus, will you please help this food to be the nourishment to my body as we are about to put away something that, that, that has a million calories, something that's so, Lord, I'm about to eat this Twinkie. Will you please make it to the nourishment of my body? Uh, you, you can pray it all day. He's not going to somehow transfigure the, the, the Twinkie into a salad. It doesn't work. You, you can pray it if you want. You can bless, you can bless, bless, bless. It doesn't work. It's more... If we are foolish, if we are foolish, it's, the prayer is not going to save you or help. And, and y'all, I'm, I'm preaching this because I dearly, dearly love you. I, I love you. I see our board in the back and people who are sick. I also have very good friends, family members. Some, some people die way too early. It's hard. I don't, I, I'm, I'm convinced that, that, that we need to take better care of our bodies. I come from a family myself of heart disease and diabetes and cancers and strokes and heart attacks. And, and, and I don't think we have to live like this. And, uh, and I lament it. We can do better, me and you. We can do better. There, there, there are people very, very close to me and I get fatigued with praying for their health while they eat like fools. And they live like fools. And they say, oh, you know, will you pray for my health? Sure. Over and over again. I'm fatigued with doing it even for myself. I, I want to be around for my children and my grandchildren and my wife. I want to. But we Americans are the undisputed champions of gluttony. We get the Olympic gold medal here. We get it because we are so, um, uh, we have so much money, so much uh, uh, access. And so we, 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 we go crazy with it. I've never preached on it before, but I'm amazed as I thought about it, how applicable this is to the Christian life. This is an important part of Christianity. I want you to think back to 1 Corinthians 6. It says, do you not know that your body is the holy temple of God? Holy temple of God. It does not belong to you. It belongs to God. You have given it away. Therefore, you have to be a steward of that which God owns, not us, but the Lord. Now, 
the context in which he says, don't you, don't you know that your body is the holy temple of God? It is the, the, the context is sexuality. It's immoral sexual behavior. So he says, don't get involved in all of that because your body is the temple of God. But it also really, really does apply to how we treat our bodies in a lot of ways, how we eat and, uh, and, 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 and exercise. After we give our lives to the Lord, we become stewards of our body because the Lord owns it. I, I love the story of that woman and she's walking through her neighborhood and she sees one of the oldest men in the whole neighborhood that she has ever seen. And he's out on his front porch and he's stooped way over and he has a cane. He's lost all of his hair and he's just there and he sits down, barely gets down and he is rocking in a chair, but he is smiling from ear to ear. He's the happiest, oldest man she has ever, ever seen. And so she goes up to him and she says, sir, your smile just amazes me. Can you tell me what is your secret for such a, a long, long, happy life? And he said to her, well, I, I smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. I drink a whole case of whiskey in a week. I eat fatty foods and I never exercise. And she goes, that is remarkable. It's remarkable. How old are you? And he said, I'm 26 years old today. <laughs> I, I've, I've heard people say it, it's... You know, Ross, it's impossible to live healthy in our culture. I sympathize with that a little. I, I get it. It is hard. Um, sometimes we eat so much fast food, you can almost get addicted to it. What's your fast food favorite? I'm a Taco Bell guy. I like it. In fact, when we were on our sabbatical in England, um, we were there. England has no Taco Bells at all. And uh, we're there, and, and, and you'll be toward the end, there was something inside, I was kind of craving it. I wanted to go and, 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 and get it, and I come home, it was one of the first things I did. It's hard in our culture, I, I, I do get it, but when we say it's impossible, we just can't live, there's too much um, of this kind of food everywhere. It's just kind of a part of our life, it, it just, it's the rhythm of what we do. No, 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 no. Y'all know who had it much harder in his context? Daniel. The, in, the book of, in the book of Daniel, they had, the Babylonians had come in and they take all the Jews and they uh, exile them in Babylon. And in Babylon, I mean, the whole, they, everybody ate poorly. You just eat all of the fatty foods you want, tons of sugar apparently, and all, just all of that. And God said to Daniel, I don't want you to eat like the rest of these people. I want you to be different. And by the way, that is the word for holy. I want you to be holy. I want you to be different. And so the Bible says Daniel ate better than, than everybody else in Babylon. And because of that, he was healthier and he was more well-nourished than all of them. And y'all, if Daniel can do it in exile, in a place that was forcing him, forcing, almost force-feeding him, nearly force-feeding him their bad food, if Daniel can resist that, we can too. I mean, and we have the Holy Spirit helping us. We can do it. I, but I get it that it's hard. I, I know it is. The, uh, when I was um, in seminary in Waco, I'd go to Baylor and, and everything, and, and there was a, uh, on one of kind of the back roads, there was a, a fast food restaurant, and on the sign it said, fat-free French, French fries. And, and I thought, well, that's funny. I'm going to see what it's about. I go in and get a hamburger and, um, and I'm watching and I order French fries and so I'm watching how they're doing it. Sure enough, man, they dip it in the grease like everybody. They pull it out and all of the grease and everything is dripping from it and they bring it over. And so I'm, I, I asked the lady, tell me about the, the fat-free French fries. Y'all just pulled it out. It's no, they're normal French fries. And she laughs and she says, it's a joke. She said, the joke is, um, we charge money for the potatoes, but the fat is free. <laughs> Fat-free French fries. And I said, that's great. I get it. It's a good joke, ma'am. It's, it's difficult in our, in our situation to be healthy. I am convinced, y'all, we can do it. But here's how. It, it's going to take all of us. 
it's going to take every one of you and me and, and, and all of us coming together to say as a church and as families, would, would we all commit to the Lord something and would we try to be the healthiest church we can be? Let's all eat well. Let's exercise well. Let, let's do it together. I can't do it alone. But, but maybe with all of you, um, maybe I can. And together we can fight heart disease and cancers and strokes and diabetes and all of these things. Maybe we can. I'll tell you where you can get some of the best low-fat, healthiest meals is probably at home. Where, where you go and you, 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 you shop intentionally and you plan it out. It's a little bit uh, uh, harder perhaps, but if you plan it out, you can do it. And I know healthier food, I, I get it that it's not always the best tasting. I get it. But y'all, it's so worth it. We eat at home. It, it can be exciting. And here's what you do. If you want to make the meal, if you're thinking, Dad, gum, you, you come home, guys, and it's like, man, I got to eat chicken that tastes like cardboard. Here's how to fix a healthy the, a meal that you're not excited to eat. Invite friends over that you really like. <laughs> and then together, y'all can laugh about what you're eating and have fun. <laughs> You enjoy the company of the people that you're with. Eat with more people. Don't ever eat alone. Don't eat alone. Eat with people. Bring people in and say, we're going to do this together. Laugh about it. Eat it up. And it'll work. Consider this also. Uh, consider the theology of gluttony. I, I've, I've never read a book where gluttony is, is fleshed out theologically. Um, I, I have a ton of theological books in my office. Not a single one of them deals with gluttony. Not a one. And yet, the Bible says that this is a huge sin. Gluttony is a big... Overeating is a massive sin. But, but we ignore it. In fact, what we do sometimes is this sin that hurts people, it hurts us. What we do is we think, oh, this is no big deal. And we actually celebrate it. We celebrate sin. We don't do that with hardly any, maybe materialism, but not as much as gluttony. We celebrate gluttony, a sin. Uh, one of my favorite restaurants, the whole slogan is, um, we don't know what is enough. It's never, it's never enough. Or we don't know the meaning of enough. And, and so they take something that, that, that is a, a gluttony kind of statement, eat more, eat more, eat more, and we're going to market it. I mean, we're going to put, put it in pretty font and have good music behind it. Come, because we don't know even the meaning, not even the meaning. You get to stay here all night eating. Come on. And we think, that sounds good. That's clever marketing. And we all go in, we celebrate it like that. D. Haddock was sharing with me that he's reading a book about how certain sins... That, that, that are in our lives that we not only think are, well, these aren't that bad. They're not bad sins, but we embrace them and we celebrate them. And gluttony, he said, was at the very top of that list. And uh, here, let me show you. Here is a funny picture of what it had been like if Baptist had been in charge of the Last Supper with Jesus. <laughs> That's us, man. Dude. They, those guys, they wouldn't have been able to walk to the Garden of Gethsemane <laughs> had, had, had we been there. He, Jesus would have had to roll them out. And uh, that, yeah, that, that, that's a Baptist Last Supper. Um, we, we, we don't know the meaning of enough, and, but we should. Man, we should know because God has something better in store for us. He has work for us to do, labor for us to do, and we cannot do what God wants us to do. We can't be faithful to all that God has for our life if we're ridiculously out of shape. Um, there's a man in our church, and uh, uh, he's sweet, and he's not very old. He's in his early 50s, but he hardly ever, ever, ever comes to our church. He's barely even a member. And the reason he doesn't come, that he's not able to come, is, is because his health is so bad. And the reason is not because of genetics, but, but it's simply because he hasn't taken very good care of himself. He hasn't taken good care of himself. And so because of it, he, he can't even come. It's a big deal. 
Uh, if somebody has an injury or, or, or if you're of the age or your body is, is failing, that's one thing. But this guy's only 52 years old and, and he can't serve the Lord. And so it really does come down to this. Are you going to indulge your body or are you going to indulge the Holy Spirit and in, in the work that God has for you with his kingdom? Bad health hurts the kingdom of God. And this is one important aspect uh, that, that sets Christians apart. It definitely set us apart and during the Roman Empire. In the Roman Empire, all of the people uh, in their culture would get together and they would have gorging feasts all of the time. And, and Christians would see all kinds of actions in the Roman Empire and they would live their life differently. But I had never thought of how Christians began to live their life differently in regard to what they ate and how they ate. But then I started to see some research with it and, and, and read about how the Romans would eat versus how a lot of Christians during that time would eat and how they were very much a, a, a light in that darkness. And here is how, here's how the Romans would eat. If, you, if you've ever thought, well, you know, how, how really can, can overeating actually be a sin? Let me draw it out to its trajectory for you. The Romans would have such celebrations where it was common to eat so much that everybody who was in the dinner party would throw up all over the floor during dinner. And, and they would get so sick with, with all of the food consumption and with alcohol that they would continue and, and they, that would start at noon and they wouldn't go home after they throw up. They would throw up on purpose so that they could keep eating more and more. And it would start at noon and it would not end until past midnight. Do you like food that much? My 12 to midnight? The entire time there was a Roman biographer who, who wrote down a history of Rome during the reign of Emperor Claudius. And he, Claudius is the guy who had all of the Jews kicked out of Rome. And, and he was alive during, during Paul's uh, missionary journeys. And the, the Roman biographer was named um, Synotius. And he wrote about these gorging feasts where people would come and they would eat from noon until midnight, throwing up the entire time so that they could eat more and more. And all of their slaves would come out, clean it all up, and then they would continue to eat. It became a totally disgusting, disgusting event. And in his book, The Life of Claudius, Synodius wrote this. He said that Emperor Claudius, who reigned during the time of Paul would encourage, encourage, the, the, the emperor would encourage all the guests to pass gas while they were eating at the tables. And even gave an edict, an edict. If you are here, this is what you have to do. An edict to pass gas at the table. The people were throwing up, passing gas, and even having bouts of diarrhea that sounds exciting. What a dinner party, right? They were consumed with the sin of excess and gluttony. Now, y'all, if you have ever thought, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm overeating a little bit. That's no big deal, though. Here's what we often do to help us understand so that we can put sin into perspective. It's like when somebody, I might tell my children, we don't lie even a little bit. And then we tell them, if you are okay with a little bit of lying, and we draw it out, draw it out, and we say, here's the massive trouble that you can get in when you lie. So we allow them to see here's where something little is, is actually attached to something big if you just let it get out of control. No one has ever told me that in regard to eating. But when I read this about what the Romans were doing, I think, ah, yeah, overeating is a pretty big sin. It's disgusting. It's huge. It, it, it hurts us. Now, y'all, we, we, we don't. I've never, ever been to anything like that. We don't take it near that far. But, but here's what we do, because our, our dinner parties are not a once a week or a once a month. They didn't have those every night. Maybe a few times a year, maybe once a month or something, they would do it. So what we do is we don't eat that much in one moment, but we eat a whole lot every day. Every, every, every day. And I wonder this, I wonder the cumulative effect that, that, that if you eat um, a whole lot, Every day, I wonder if the cumulative effect is actually worse for our health than it was for them. 
and, and the problem is, is that I care about all of you and, and I need you. And God needs you here in the church. We need you to invest in the ministries. We need you to serve children and youth. We need you to go and be involved in mission work in our community. But if you're too sick, you can't. And I think that's why Paul said to the Romans in chapter 12, um, offer your body as a living sacrifice. Bring your whole body and sacrifice it to the Lord. It's not yours. This is a spiritual, he said, when you offer your body to the Lord, it is a spiritual act of worship, a spiritual act of worship. And so what, what can we do to try to, to offer our body to the Lord as a spiritual act of worship? Um, I want to introduce to all of you somebody that you know already very, very well, a wonderful deacon in our church. And uh, he has a degree in this, a college degree, and he has researched it and he has experience with it. He is a wellness and fitness coach in our community and he runs the, the Veris Health Program. And so I want Calvin Richard to come in to share with y'all a couple things about this. Calvin, come up, bud. Thank you, buddy. Good morning, sir. So a uh, young man comes to me and says he wants to uh, do some, something about his health. He was overweight and not doing well. Uh, we sat down and he said, Coach, it's, I've been trying. It's hard for me because uh, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity runs in my family. And I said, son, the problem is nobody runs in your family. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's sitting there watching Netflix and chilling. <laughs> A lot of these things are, are, are caught. It's, it's not necessarily taught, but it's in the environment. It's the things that we do around each other. So when, when Ross was asking to me to come and, and help with this, I'm like, this is the first time I'm coming before you guys, and we're going to talk about gluttony and exercise. Now, it was a trap, guys. Um, it's, it says up there. But I know that what I do for a living is not the most popular. Um, if you had a 45-minute massage or you can have a 45-minute workout, most people are going to go for the massage. <laughs> But I know God has called me to be a temple builder. And my, my, my mission in life is to help people have more courage, more joy, and more impact in life. That comes, part of that is coming from how you take care of these temples, this rental property that God has given us, okay? It's his property, as, as Pastor said about stewardship. That's the part about it. So I just wanna to talk to you about two different areas is how we move and how we eat, all right? There's many other things, Stress and sleep and hydration, all these things are important. I mean, hydration, we, our bodies are 75% water. We need to drink water. Wait, the earth is 75% water, too. That's, huh, I wonder if God knew what he was doing with that. <laughs> but the reason why we talk about these two is because of the stats. Look at the stats here. In the U.S., obesity has gone from 30.5% in 1999 to 42.5% in 2020. We're getting fluffier. And it's usually by, by the decisions that we're making. Pretty soon, half of the population is going to be obese. This is, the, this is the pandemic. This is where we're going to. And most of us are doing this and digging out only early grave with a knife and fork. Here's the next one here. Based on federal standards, only 22.9% of adults are getting enough ex exercise. So 80% of us aren't moving in a suffice manner to have maintain a healthy weight or get off um, in the, the weight itself. So looking at that, I, I've been known as being the excuse killer. So I hear them all, I've heard them all, even I can't work out because my hair hurts. <laughs> I, 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 I legit heard that from somebody, just saying that this, this is where it's at. But what are some of the common excuses for, for not working out? Yell them out, guys. Not enough time. Too hot. You move, you move to Texas. You know you live in Texas, right? <laughs> it's hot here all the time. It's, it hasn't changed. And it, it, what else? Lazy. Not motivated. I hear all these different ones that, uh, that come, come through. There's somebody, whatever your excuse or excuses are, there's somebody in the same situation or worse that has made it happen. Someone has done that. But a lot of times we just make the excuse and not recognize, what is it? Just ask yourself, what can I do to overcome this excuse? What can, I over, what can I overcome? Injuries, you know, that's what we specialize in, working with folks with injuries uh, to make it happen. So, I found is that moms, I know this is Father's Day, but here's a common story I get from the moms. If I'm working, 
Work is busy, take care of the husband, the kids, the house, all these things, and whatever scraps left over is what I give to myself. And if you actually do something for yourself, you feel guilty about it. Sound about right, moms? If you look at elite endurance athletes, it's ages upper 40s, 50s, and 60s who are doing absolutely well in triathlons and these, these different th kind of things like that because they didn't do it in their 20s and 30s. They didn't have the time to do it. It wasn't important to do it. So thank God they were able to do some of those things, but most would just continue on the same role and not take care of their bodies. But there's always the excuses that are out there. So I've literally had in the same workout session an NFL offensive lineman with a lady who's 74 years old with two knee replacements. Everything is scalable, just move. What can you do simply and consistently? I was a fitness manager at Horseshoe Bay Resort and had a young lady, I always call her a young lady. She's 84, her, she lost her husband and she had a stroke. And so her goal was, her needs were not to be super strong, but was balanced. I wanted to help prevent her slip and falls. And when she came in, I took her cane and we joked the whole hour. I wanted this to be the most joyful and impactful hour of her day. And we just laughed and I made fun of her and we did back and forth, and, and, but she didn't fall. She kept it. So everyone's, it's different for what you need. So whatever it is, oh, I'm not doing this, it's always just some kind of improvement. What can you do consistently? So let's go to food. The whole glutton part we always talk about there. So the term comfort food, I'd never heard that until I moved to Texas. <laughs> now, I don't know if that is because everything is comfort food in New Orleans, but it's just what it is. But think about this. I just got a new job. Let's go eat. I just lost my job. Let's go eat or drink or whatever it may be. The vice comes in there. We've related the eating to the emotions behind it, and it's not like that. If you, if you ever talk to a, 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 a bodybuilder, and they're talking about, they're eating bland chicken and broccoli and these things. They'll tell you, I'm not eating chicken and broccoli. I'm taking in protein. It's a different mindset. They're fueling, they're fueling their body for what's necessary. It's just a shift of what we believe about food, what we believe about those particular things. Um, clean your plate. I'm 45. I'm coming from the era of clean your plate, right? Can't go outside, can't do whatever it was, fill in the blank, until you clean your plate. Also, clean your plate so you can get dessert. Let's overeat so that you can overeat. This is the culture we've been in. I get it. Y'all probably heard it. There's starving kids in Africa that wish they had the food that you had. Yes, we heard it all that. But there's a balance in that thing, because some of us come from eras over, over, um, over fixing the problem, because they come from the Depression era when it didn't have, so you, it was wasteful. So we over, over, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Overcompensated. There you go, overcompensated for that particular situation. And here we are on the other end of it. So what does the great Billy Graham, the great evangelist says about gluttony? He says, it is a sin that most of us commit, but few of us mention. It is one of the prevalent sins among Christians. We never seem satisfied. He also says, gluttony is saying more to anything when you should be saying enough. Last one is gluttony is enslavement to our appetite. Let, let those sink in a little bit. Had a lady uh, came to start working out with us. She's five foot nothing, almost 400 pounds. First day she came in and, and doing a warm, warm up, fell, heard a pop in the knee, thought, tore, th tore something up, she's definitely done, kept moving. Got back up, most of us would have stopped the embarrassment behind it. She kept going, and I found out later on that just a few months prior to that, she had lost a child, had to have a stillbirth because she was diabetic, had high blood pressure, was obese, was not fit enough to care care of the child and had to bear the child. Fast forward 175 pounds down, at age 39, Coach, I'm sick. I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm just feeling like, girl, you're pregnant. I'm not pregnant. I'm too old. I, I can't have kids. Can't. At six pregnancy tests later, <laughs> she's pregnant at, 30, at 39 and was able to bring forth a happy, healthy, strong child. This is not just about you. That opportunity was for her to bring forth a godly child. 
You're doing this not for just yourself. It's for your kids and your grandkids, your legacy, the people you work with, whatever it may be. It's more than just you as far as taking care of your temple, this rental property that God has given us. So what do you start? Romans 12, 2, we were in Romans earlier. Uh, my favorite scripture is, be not conformed to this world, but you, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to change your mind about it. You have to make a, new, make a decision that I'm going to do something. That something might be do one squat. It may be I'm going to say no to one other sugary something. Whatever it is, it's a decision to say I'm going to take captive of the addiction or the problems and the issues that I've been having because there's somebody that's dependent upon me. Nabal was given a blessing. He was blessed, but he was a horrible student, steward of the temple that was given to him. So if we're supposed to live this abundant, full life, it starts with taking care of God's rental property, these, these temples that he's given us. Thank you. Thank you, Calvin. <laughs> Y'all, as we close, um, this is more important spiritually for the kingdom of God, for your family, for the people you love, people that you love the most, how important this is. God has given us so, so much, and, and, and we need one another. Could, could we all join together as we often do? We, we, we say, let, let, let's get together and, and build a mission center. Let's get together and, and send missionaries out. Let's come to the altars and, and give our lives and renew our lives to the Lord in all kinds of ways. I wonder if today, I've, I've never done it, for the, we, we, during this invitation, would you respond to the Lord if he invites you to, to say this, Lord, I'm, I want to eat better and I want to exercise and take better care of my body for my loved ones and for you, my God, and for my church so that I can do everything that you're calling me to do. And Lord, I do it to bring you glory. During the invitation, what a spiritual thing that is. And I'll do it with you and I want to do this with you, but I need help. And so would you bow your heads with me?